Hello and welcome to Art Museums Can Help Me Teach. We're so glad that you are joining us. This is a recording from our webinar that was on Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. My name is Cody Tallarico and I am the Fine Arts Education Specialist at the Nebraska Department of Education. And we'd just like to share our mission, which is to lead and support the preparation of all Nebraskans for learning, earning, and living. I hope you'll take some time to learn more about NDE Fine Arts by accessing our website at education.ne.gov slash fine arts. And I hope you'll consider signing up for our mailing list so that we can keep up to date with what's going on with fine arts at the state level in Nebraska. This presentation is presented in collaboration with the Nebraska Art Teachers Association. They are a professional teacher organization that champions art across Nebraska and um, really looks for creative growth and innovation. They provide tools and resources to equitably advance high quality visual arts design and media arts education and support diverse groups of populations and communities of practice. They are the local chapter of the National Art Educators Association and you can learn more about uh, them at NebraskaArtEducators.org. We are super excited to present this presentation in collaboration with SAM, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. The Smithsonian American Art Museum and Leonard Gallery is dedicated to collecting, understanding, and enjoying American art. The museum is one of the 19 museums that comprise the entire Smithsonian Institution, our nation's museum, and the um, museum celebrates extraordinary creativity of artists whose work reflect the American experience and global connections. Tonight, the presentation will be presented by Peg, and Peg is the REACH Education Specialist at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and REACH stands for the Rural Engagement in Art, Culture, and History. As a former program manager at the National Museum of Natural History, Peg designed and assessed the museum's first national outreach education program. Along with teaching art in public schools, Peg has been the education curator at art museums, including the Seattle Art Museum in Washington, the Muse Madison Museum of Contemporary Arts in Wisconsin, and the Herbert F. Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell University in New York. She is also a John F. Kennedy National Teaching Artist with her Museum in Progress program, and since that inception of the program, Peg has co-created more than 250 interactive exhibitions in schools across the country with students in grades pre-K through 12. I hope you enjoy Art Museums Can Help Me Teach and that you learn a lot. Please be sure to access the presentation, toggle on those speaker notes so you have access to all of the wonderful information that Peg can share, and contact me if you need more information. And thank you all for joining us. Yes, thanks. So as the title says, art museums can help me teach. And we have found a lot of people just expect us to come out with some kind of artwork or some kind of object, explain it and be done with it. But what you're gonna see tonight is not only how to explore those artworks, how to analyze them, but you're gonna be going through a number of creative thinking strategies and realizing that arts can be integrated, which I think I'm probably talking to the choir here that everybody, knows it can be done in different subjects, but I'm going to give you some examples of how we handle that at our museum. And Cody, we can always go back to this section, right, to be able to give them your information. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I'm in charge of REACH, that rural engagement in art, culture, and history. And please take down my email address there if you've got any questions or want to contact me afterwards. The Secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch, has designated that we would, are trying to be able to be in every classroom in the country. And that means especially the emphasis on rural. So if you are a rural teacher, especially get in touch with me because what I'm about to show you again, we can continue to work with you and your students. And if you're not rural, don't worry, get in touch with me. It's all relative because here I am sitting in Washington, DC, you're out there in Nebraska. And so that's what we mean, it's all relative. We do not have defined parameters as to what rural means. So this is the building where I have my office and others also share it with the National Portrait Gallery. So if you ever have a chance to come to Washington DC, you'll have a chance to be able to see where we are located north of the National Mall for the Washington Monument at one end and the Capitol at the other end in the White House up here. So we're just a short walk up the street. Then, 
I want to start off by asking you to respond either by unmiking or by able to put something in the chat box. I want you to tell me what your first impressions are when you look at this person. Cody, anything in the chat box? Anybody want to mention? Is everybody going to be quiet on me tonight? <laughs> and we've got appears to be a person of importance, a Native American and full regalia. Uh, okay. Native American, indigenous, Native. So if I was with your students, I would be asking you to tell me how you came to those conclusions. But because I have a lot of things I'm gonna to show to you tonight and, and engage you with, I'm gonna to just touch upon some key things here. So now that's a very simple question. I asked you to take a look at it and tell me what you see. Now I'm gonna ask you a question that I hope is gonna ask you to look at something differently. I want you to think if you are gonna have a partner and you are going to describe the next work I'm about to show you. How would you describe it? And this is the way I would do it with your students if it was in the classroom. I'd ask them to pair up. One would be ready to describe, and the other one would be ready with pencil and paper to draw based on the description. So think about what you would say if you had only 45 seconds. Now, I'm not going to wait 45 seconds, but the idea of this is that the students would immediately know I'm not expecting them to be a great artist. And the person who's drawing has to listen really carefully to those descriptions. And once the 45 seconds are up, I ask, did you give them any idea of size or location or scale or proportions? Did you name specific objects that you think they would recognize? Did you, they, you tell them the angle? at which perhaps this body is positioned. In other words, how complete, how colorful was your vocabulary? And the students begin to realize that I am asking them to think very hard about what they say to somebody to form an image in their mind. Now, if you were paired up with somebody, that person who was doing the drawing, they now have a reason to turn around and really look at this piece. They wanna see how well they were able to interpret what their partner was describing to them. So I've just given you two completely different ways that we might introduce this artwork. And it happens to be one artwork. So anybody want to tell me what you see that might be similar or different between these two figures? I'm the one that made the comment about the, the first person looks like to be a, a character or a person of importance. And I think that could be said of the second person as well, just based on posture, clothing, the things they're carrying. Okay. In the chat, I have similar hair and jewelry. Okay. So now I've given you a third way to take a look at this, and that's with compare and contrast. And by the time we get into this part, we've already spent a good number of minutes with this work. And then I get to tell you, it's the same person. And it was painted by George Catlin. You may be familiar with him. He was a lawyer and he also wanted to be a painter. And when President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, he worried that all tribes would disappear. So he put away his lawyer uh, firm and picked up his paints and off he went to capture as many tribal nations as he could. This one in particular was purely by chance he met this man whose name translates the pigeon egghead on his way to Washington DC to argue for his tribe to be able to keep their land. George Catlin met him on his way back 18 months later. And with students, we like to talk about 
Why do you think he changed? Anybody have any idea? Uh, this is Sharon. He might be more receptive or received better if he was dressing like the people who he was trying to address. Yeah. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, definitely get the students to think about, we're talking about 1837. And would he have any idea how the US government is run? He'd walk in there and see the way they're dressed, see the way they're acting, wanting to be able to understood and wondering if he had the language to be understood. And the sad part is when he came back to tell his tribe about what he saw and the buildings and how people acted in Washington, DC, they thought he had gone nuts and they murdered him. So we'll be talking to the students about, again, your language, how you try to evoke a particular idea and an image in somebody who's never experienced it. And how do you be able to make them understand that this is a whole different world? But we don't want to leave students thinking American Indians have disappeared, that at the same time, they, during the 1830s, did not have the same training that George Catlin did. They did not depict themselves the way he did. So we like to compare it to work that we've got more of more contemporary American Indian artists. And we like to talk about how they depict themselves and how they relate to their own culture. So this particular piece that you're looking at is done in regards to being able to show Pueblo American Indians and during a particular celebration, a particular ceremony. And again, we would then compare it to George Catlin and how a culture looks at themselves and how somebody outside that culture looks at it. So you can see there's a lot of different layers here by which we can approach this work. Anybody have any questions at this point? All right, I'm gonna keep going then. So now let's switch gears. I'm gonna show you work that was actually inspired by a poem. And I would show students this work first, just to give them you know, a minute to take a look at it. But then I would also ask them to compare it to the words in this poem. And how do they think Robert Indiana, the painter, evoked what he read in this poem? And students would, especially for doing a video conference, come up and do a comparison, pick out words from the poem, see what they can find in the painting. Now, I think you can pretty easily do that, but I'm gonna ask you a question a little bit differently. Do you think there's anything in the poem they might have trouble seeing represented in the artwork? Or do you think it's all fairly clear? This is well, I think as, an, as an adult, knowing this painting pretty well and seeing this poem, I think it's pretty well represented, but I think kids might have trouble seeing the siren howling. Aha. Uh -huh. They do. I was going along those same lines of seeing the truck moving. Aha. Uh -huh. Movement. Yep. And if you look at the word at the words of wheels rumbling, sometimes they need a little help to be able to look at this and think about that as motion, kind of like the way we think of old-fashioned movies and how you see something, you know, ch -ch 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 -ch, and that motion captured in stills but still going by very quickly. And then we have to explain about the fives and how Indiana was representing sirens as they come towards you and get louder, and also as they go away from you and get fainter. So what we're really doing is using language here to help them be able to interpret and vocalize what they see and hear, but at the same time knowing they may need some bridges, they may see some help being able to link that vocabulary to the artwork. All right, now I'm gonna ask you to grab a piece of paper. I'm sorry if we didn't tell you ahead of time to do it, but grab a piece of paper and I want you to hold it horizontally or landscape. And I'm gonna walk through a couple of directives. 
with the next work. So let me explain the first thing I want you to do. When I unveil the next work, I want you to notice where your eye goes first. And whatever it sees first, I want you to circle that. Don't worry about details. Just circle it. And I want you to place it on your paper. I want you to treat your paper as if it's the whole artwork. So whatever you see first, you're going to circle it about the size and scale that it is to fit on your paper and place it on your paper in the location it is. All right, you ready? What's the first thing your eye goes to? Again, you're just going to circle it, place it on your paper about where it is in this composition. And I'm going to give you three more directives, and we're going to do it pretty quickly. So I want you to notice how your eye moves from the first place it goes to to around the rest of the artwork. And I want you to draw a line that represents that path. You may not see every inch of this. That's okay. I just want you to draw a path that follows how your eye moves around the rest of the work. Now I want you to pretend you're putting glasses on that only let you see geometric shapes. So now you're gonna start drawing circles, ellipses, triangles, trapezoids, rectangles. And I want you to divide your paper up as if it's a geometric puzzle, only drawing those shapes. You may have some that are inside of each other, adjoining, turned one direction, turned in the other direction. You're just going to be drawing the outlines of geometric shapes. Okay, and last, what I'd like you to do is now take your pencil and I want you to darken in the darkest areas of this print and lightly shade in the light gray areas. If you don't have a pencil, it's okay. Just somehow indicate the darkest areas of the piece, the grayish areas, and leave the lightest areas the color of your paper. So you can see how this activity could easily be done much longer in between all the directives that I've given you. But what I want you to do now to understand how your eye has been manipulated by this composition, I want you to go back to the very first thing your eye looked at. And I want you to think, why did it go there? Was it the subject matter? Was its location? Was its contrast to the other colors around it? Was it size, its shape, or how the other shapes directed your eye to it? And I'd love to hear some people share out what did your eye go to first and why do you think it did? This may sound weird, but I went to the gentleman sitting his pants because they were white. Everything else over there is dark. And okay. I really look every place else, but it's like on his pants stood out. Okay. And there's nothing weird about that. But you, because you, you knew why it was that contrast and they just seemed to stand out. Anybody else? Well, and I followed the direction of the lady on the right, her skirt, and then had to circle back around to see the things that were dark. So you were very uh, conscious then of movement, of how your eyes moved around the piece, but also that contrast. Anybody else? In the chat, we have all hands going to the table. Aha. We'll talk about that in a sec. I'm kind of a rule of thirds kind of person. So if you follow the rule of thirds, mine went to the young lady that's uh, standing there 
kind of off to the center of right there, off to the right of center there. Okay. But why her, give, give a little more explanation, Bob, as to why the rule of thirds help you see her. Uh, because generally, if you follow the rule of thirds, you divide this uh, painting into tic-tac-toe board, and she happens to fall right in one of the four quadrants or where, where the lines would intersect. So uh, it, it could be the contrast of the dress with the kind of the cummerbund piece here that kind of drew my attention right away. Yeah. All right. And in the, in the chat, we have the map and uh, starting to follow the eyes of each subject that appears that they are looking down to the man sitting. Okay. So great job, everybody. You can see how this is something that if you keep practicing it, it's really gonna make you aware of the composition and that what the artists had to think about before they even faced this blank canvas or the blank piece of paper. So once you get that under your skin and understand how to do it, it's something that it just really is valuable to keep practicing it. And not just with a work that has uh, realism in it, but try it again with abstract works. Try to figure out why your eye might be going to where it is and why it's leading itself around the piece, or maybe not even bothering to look at anything else in the rest of the piece and become conscious of what your eyes notice first. And those examples that I gave you are just the tip of those elements that an artist can manipulate. But then we go on to explain that this is George Washington with his wife and his grandchildren. And you may not remember, he was a surveyor. And this map and the fan that she's holding and the sword that he's holding are pointing to lands that both he and Martha Washington owned. And George Washington is said to have preferred being documented with his family as opposed to the portraits that you see him by himself on his own. But you also notice that they've got in the background to the right there, an African-American man who's very passive compared to what's going on here. So the question is, is he in there as an indication of wealth, being an enslaved person? Is it meant that we treat them well, look at the way he's dressed? It raises all sorts of questions that we can explore further. And then look at the one grandson with his hand on the globe as an indicator that the world can open up to him. Whereas George and Martha are focused on what they know they own and what they can highly recommend for land to build the Washington Capitol on. As I understand it, they didn't own the land that eventually the Capitol was built on, but they could strongly recommend where to place and develop Washington, DC. Any questions about that activity? All right, so I'm gonna go to the next one. And again, for the sake of time, I am going to just quickly run through this in case you want to use this PowerPoint and explain this to your students, I've quickly drawn in examples of what could be done to show them how to treat that activity. So now, again, if I was working with your students, I would talk about this artist, Alma Thomas, and how she didn't start painting until after she finished teaching and retired from teaching. She was well up there in years but she was strongly influenced by nature and her garden and music. So which of these works do you think might've been inspired by jazz? And which one do you think might've been inspired by a, Georgian, a Gregorian chant? And be ready to say why. And if I was with your students, I would play that music just in case they're not too familiar with it. But I think perhaps you might know what those differences are. I think Cody would. <laughs> Jazz or rock and roll, what do you think and why? Well, I don't see anything coming up in the chat, so I'll speak up. And I would say rock and roll, or well, or jazz, because um, I'm seeing like um, Charlie Parker, which I can't think of. It's this 
specific uh, silo jam. Um, it'll come to me because of all <laughs> the little bits and pieces. So which one, Cody, do you think was inspired by rock and roll or jazz? The red or the green, if you want to use those indicators. I would say the red because typically, like when I think of chant, I think more in the different modes and everything. And so they're usually a darker color. Um, Aaron says red inspired by jazz, more varied and improvisational. Green inspired by chant, organized, regular, and repetitive. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, guess what? You guessed correctly. And normally, it's not that we are trying to get the students to exactly guess which one, but in this case, we want them to think more deeply about why. And you gave great reasons for the way they're organized and especially for the coloration and the choices made and the patterns or lack of an obvious pattern that are there. So this might be an introduction to a video conference on music. All right, now I'm gonna switch you over to STEM plus art. And the reason why I say that is because we've learned some places don't like STEAM. So we play it safe. We do STEM plus art. Anybody have any idea what this is made from? You probably guess this. We, they look to be sambers. The textural part looks like sambers to me. I'm not sure what a samber is, if that's a, a, a label, you know, native to Nebraska. Is that like a burr? Yes, a sm okay. very small one. Yes, exactly. You got it. So this is a burr basket. And we would bring in conservation as a way of being able to tackle science, STEM, engineering ideas by letting everyone know the challenge that this has been presented to our conservators. It is slowly sinking. It's slowly use, losing its sphere, spherical shape. So we would ask students what they think they might do to bring it back to its original shape. But there's a caveat. Conservators cannot do something that can't be undone. So they can't put, you know, glue all over the whole thing and gush it back together again and let it harden and never be able to take it apart. They've got to be able to do something that's going to help it restore its shape, keep it that way when it's in storage, and then be able to remove whatever it is they use when it's put out on display. So I'm going to give you some choices here. Balloons, clay, straw, crushed paper, chopsticks, belts, plastic bags, styrofoam peanuts. What would you use to help that maintain its shape and storage, yet could be removed for when we want to put it out on display? Any thoughts? I said straw, but you know I meant pipe cleaners here. I think the balloon would be best. I think it's going to give you the closest shape. And I think it's going to be the easiest and less destructive to take out or remove. OK. I'm going to ask you a question back, Sharon. Remember, okay. these are burrs with spikes on them. It's I assume you would think to blow that balloon up, then what might happen okay. to it? It's a strong balloon. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Cameron said, thinking my students, they wouldn't want to make a combination of materials and they wouldn't want to pick one as an elementary kid. That's interesting. Yeah. So we'd have to do a little bit of guidance there, maybe. Any other ideas? Well, if you ever have a chance to come to my museum, we've got five conservation labs that have floor to ceiling glass walls, and you can watch them repair frames, 
glue or attach sculptures back together, repair works on paper, do in painting to paintings. It's really fascinating. There are also very short videos on our website that show them demonstrating very quickly how they do those different techniques. All right, so I'm gonna tell you if there aren't any more ideas, Cody. None, okay. They actually took the plastic bags, put them inside the burr basket and filled them gently with the styrofoam peanuts and gently pressed down on them. Very similar to what you would do if you were sitting in a beanbag chair. And then when it was time to put it on display, they could just lift out the styrofoam peanuts and then lift out the bag. And they also put in a, a uh, model of the burr basket, put that inside this box and sprayed foam around it, took the model out and then lined it with felt backed aluminum foil so when they put the burr basket in, they could lift these strips up and lift the burr basket out without ever having to handle it. And what you saw just before this image is how we would help students explain the process of scientific engineering thinking that they would go through in order to be able to come up with a solution for this. So now I'm gonna switch and talk about something in our collection that usually surprises most people. We collect video games. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is because we like to have students think about them, not just as something fun to play or something to conquer, but to break down the different languages that are in video games. And the man who created this piece, Genova Chin, moved from Singapore to California. And that's the first time he saw grass in his life. So he wanted to make a video game about grass. And we would ask students a series of different questions about it, but mainly talk to them about the different languages you would need to learn in order to create video games. And I've got short videos to play that help hear Genova Chen talk about the sites that you see, the motion he wanted to develop, the story behind it, and the sound and music that has been added to it. So I wanted students to realize the look of video games as an art form, but realize that when you break it down, you've gotta be thinking and manipulating all these. Just think back to that picture where you looked at uh, George Washington and his family. You've gotta think about all those different elements that you can manipulate and then be able to figure out what the message is that you wanna share. So now I'm gonna turn to some of those resources that we kept talking about. You can go to our education website and you can see how it's been broken down into different sections and one is devoted to K-12 teachers. And we've got education, professional development. Most of it is online, some of it is done on site, but anybody can sign up for these, they're free. And all you have to do is go to our website and just register. The Artful Connections are 11 topics of video conferences that we offer, again, free for third through 12th grade. And these are done per class. It's not an assembly. We wanna be able to gauge the students in conversations just like I've been doing with you. And one of the latest topics that we offer, uh, added is one here called Social Commentary, Social Action. And we added that because we got a lot of requests from teachers saying, I want my students to understand how to express their voices in ways other than going in the street and protesting. So this takes that angle. How do you have an issue that you wanna deal with and how, do you, how can you express that and hopefully cause some positive change? Then we also have a ton of different teacher guides and you can scroll through this and be able to find many, many different lesson plans. Many of them are in Spanish and English including, I'll get to it in a second, we've got videos of interviewing artists who are alive and in our collection. We also have video interviews done with curators. We also have documented every time an artist has come through and given a talk at the museum. What I mentioned just a second ago is that we've got in Spanish and English two 
social emotional learning toolkits. We've got posters that you can download and print, again, Spanish and English, and with all sorts of ideas of how to be able to help your students look at them and analyze them. And one of those SEL toolkits is this one, which was the second one that was developed. So again, going to our website is going to be able to give you all that information. And again, it's all free. We are actually looking to do a second printing, excuse me, a third printing of Chicana graphic posters that were printed in conjunction with our Chicana graphic exhibit that we had a number of years ago. And if you're interested in being able to get on that mailing list, let me know because I can tell you when those posters are ready. I just found out today they hope to have them by early summer. I know when working with a lot of rural groups around the country that they're very much interested in place-based learning. And one of the first questions I get is, what do you have from my area of the world? What do you have that depicts Nebraska or Hawaii or Alaska? And we may not necessarily have something in our collection that meets that uh, request, but I want to find out more about what are the concepts that you want your students to understand. So I'll give you a simple example. I'm working with a very tiny, tiny town in one of the islands of Hawaii. And they asked me to help teach first graders economic standards of what's the difference between goods and services. And I did not have any goods or services that were obviously placed in Hawaii. So instead, I did the video conference as an introduction to that concept and used goods and services depicted in our collection. And then the teachers took that as an introduction and then added to it using things from around their community and their environment. But if you want to talk about place, one of our most iconic works is this work by Nam Joon Paik, a South Korean man who came to the States as an adult. He's considered the grandfather of video art. And what you're looking at is neon outlining each state. And within each state are monitors showing video that he felt depicted that state at the time that he came to this country. He didn't travel much from New York City. Instead, he learned a lot about the country through TVs and movies. So, for example, in Kansas, he's playing The Wizard of Oz. And then he asked specifically that the loudest video playing is Martin Luther King Jr. in Alabama talking about his I Have a Dream speech. So this was done in 1995. And when we can zoom in, say, on Nebraska, what we'd like to do is ask the students, what would you put in there today compared to what this man put in almost 30 years ago? Would you keep it the same or how would you make it and change it around? So what we like to do in working with this piece, if we include it in the video conference, we've got a video that shows it completely darkened and then coming alive with all the lights and the videos playing on it. But another way to approach place-based learning is a series of lessons and videos that my colleague put together based on surveys that we have in our collection. We don't have all the photographic surveys that were done in 76, 71 for the National Endowment for the Arts, but we do have one of Baltimore and she linked up with a number of networking organizations in Baltimore. And what those students did is look at the photographs taken during this time period of Baltimore. And then they were given cameras to go out and document their community today. So that's why it's called Recording a Changing Nation. And the lesson prompts, the video interviews that you would find in this is a whole complete package that you can take and adapt to students. And if they don't have the opportunity to have cameras, use a cell phone or draw. But the idea is to get them out noticing those changes and how do they document it? Do they interview somebody, take an oral history down? This package is something that can easily be adapted in a number of different ways. So last but not least, what I want you to do, since you're watching me on a computer, I can click on this, but I think it's more effective if I give you the, actually, Cody, if you don't mind putting in the chat box, learning lab is one word, dot 
si.edu. And if everyone could minimize my screen and go to that website, I'm going to walk you through it a little bit. Learninglab.si.edu. And this image should come up. And what it does, I want you to go to the search tool. And I want you to just put in a word of something that you would like to have more information about. And you're probably going to see a little rotating square. And what's going to appear are two tabs. One says resources and one says collections. This is a tool that is drawing now from every digitized Smithsonian collection, from every museum, from every unit, from the zoo to the research centers all over the world. They're gonna find that keyword or term and they're gonna pull up those resources. You can register for free and any of those resources that you would like to be able to refer to again, you can start your own collection. You can pull that resource out, all of its metadata comes with it, and you can put it into your own collection. So remember I mentioned those two tabs, one that says resources and one that says collections. If you click on collections, you'll see if anybody else has already created a collection based on that search term that you put in there. And again, you can pull from whatever they put in there. You can add your own images to your collection. You can add your own video. And a lot of teachers and a lot of us use this as a way to put a storyboard together, or at least to have a reference tool that we want to turn around and share with students. You can see how it easily becomes a storyboard, and even better yet, a portfolio tool, and something that would help students be able to virtually demonstrate what they're learning. So again, this is all free and there's tons of YouTubes about how to be able to utilize the resources and they keep fine tuning it and bringing in all sorts of great tools and skills. But it's a trusted source. It's all primary resources that will be pulled up. And it's not just artifacts, depending on what you're looking at, you're probably seeing articles, you're probably seeing uh, video, you're probably seeing um, drawings, you're probably seeing maps, all sorts of different ways of being able to approach that term. But what I want to show you is what a number of my colleagues have done. And we've pulled these together in different collections, pretty much primarily, primarily based as disciplines. So you can see here that there were 12 collections when I last took this clip off of our website based on history and social studies but we also have them on English and language arts. You can download any of these and use them right away or be able to keep them if you wanna be able to have it for future reference. There's also science and technology, art and design, at home activities, and ones that were created by teachers that they asked if they could put up underneath our umbrella. So any collection that you create is gonna remain private unless you decide you wanna make it public. You can give that link to anybody, but it's you that decides if you want to make it public. So that is my last slide. And what I can do is go back to anything you might have questions on, or I can stop sharing and you can ask me any questions that you wish. I'm just seeing in the chat that just that while it's an amazing resource and also just an amazing opportunity for integration. Yes. Anyone hey, guy, I appreciate it. Oh, good. Yep. I was just asking for questions or comments oh, yeah. on things. Go ahead, Bob. Hey, yeah, Peg, I was just going to say, um, I appreciated those strategies you walked us through because those are things I think a lot of us who are in the art classrooms are trying to do with kids. I think you gave us other ways to think about it. But what I really love is you were asking us to think first and making those connections to our own experiences, our own world. 
and then you were providing the information. I think historically, we always taught about the image first, and then there wasn't always that opportunity for kids or, or learners to be able to make those personal connections. So allowing us to think first for ourselves and then providing that information later, I think that's a very powerful strategy. Thanks, Bob, for recognizing that. And that's the core group that I've trained of volunteers to give those video conferences that I mentioned, those 11 topics. That's what I've trained them to do because we don't want them to just lecture. We want them to be able to, first of all, make the student feel that we want to hear their voice and it matters and that they can think. And we're just going to give them the tools to be able to think even deeper. I know when I was searching the SI learning lab, I put in Nebraska and I came up with 200 and uh, 2,600 resources with Nebraska in it. So yeah. I think that's an amazing opportunity too. Yeah, the great thing about it is that you can, if you want to, narrow it down to one particular museum or unit, but at the same time, you can pull from everywhere. I'm an elementary art teacher and um, my themes I'm doing with my kids right now with my primary are uh, play, how and why we play, and then uh, sanctuary, what is a person's sanctuary with my upper elementary. I, I searched both those terms, tons of resources. So you better believe I'm going to be adding some things that I discovered to uh, my, my uh, lessons that I'm preparing over the next few weeks. Oh, that's great. I'm so glad. I've never done it for sanctuary, but that's a great term to use. Well, I'm seeing high praise from Lorinda too. She said that um, she had to go, but it was truly the best thing of her day. Oh, nice. Thank you. Yeah, it's really tough for me to say that everything is free. You know, that's, it's, it's a hard thing to sell, you know. <laughs> and I cut somebody off, whoever was jumping in, please go ahead. Well, Bob, back to your classes, you are welcome to take any of those slides and use them right away. And if you want to do that drawing activity, you know, with your students, I tried to design it so it could be applicable to any age level. You know, your youngest ones may not quite yet have a grasp, for example, of geometric shapes, but even if they just went through, they're looking for circles. And what I love doing it is with something, first of all, that they recognize, at least they think they recognize it because there's a person and there's a globe and there's a table. But when you start breaking it down to all those different elements and realize, okay, now take what you just learned and maybe let's get a little bit more abstract. And then all of a sudden, wait a minute, an abstraction that's only shapes starts to make sense. Yes, a great way to break it down. I'm going to go ahead and, and stop the recording so you're going to hear